Kia ora tātou, ko Janet Taku Ingwa, and I'm from ESR, um, and I am chairing today's session um, on engaging communities. So to kick us off in this really interesting session for the afternoon, we have Jorge from uh, Niwa, who we've all met before, um, talking about his experiences from launching Niwa's Data Science Journal Club and how that helps build a community of practice. So Jorge, whenever you're ready. Uh, I'm going to, to present uh, uh, an initiative that we have been running at uh, NIWA uh, for the past uh, two years and uh, yeah, trying to draw uh, recommendations and yeah, thoughts uh, about. Uh, so as a means of an introduction, uh, at uh, NIWA, we generate and we analyze lots of data, uh, but also those lots of data come from many, many different sources. So we have uh, freshwater ecology, fisheries, uh, air quality monitoring, air composition, hydrology, numerical model of the weather, uh, atmospheric observations, uh, marine ecology, marine geology. Uh, and that uh, that is a strength, but uh, it also poses a, a challenge in which uh, it needs really a concerted effort to uh, to, to avoid this to get uh, compartmentalized uh, in uh, siloed in the in the organization. Uh, and um, around four years ago, thereabouts, uh, that was addressed as an institutional level uh, with uh, the data science uh, strategy and the creation of the data science um, team. Uh, but uh, at the meantime, uh, in a more informal and organic way, we have uh, been running this community of practice, basically a way of learn to each other, uh, which um, also complements quite, uh, quite nicely that, uh, that approach. So uh, a bit of uh, history. Uh, we uh, the, the the founding principle of uh, this community of practice was uh, to bring in as many people as possible that uh, nobody uh, would feel that uh, they uh, didn't have anything to or they don't have uh, something to contribute or that uh, they don't have. Um, uh, um, uh, they don't have means of uh, participation. So we focus on five uh, principles, one being informal. Uh, the second one is that uh, being flexible that would allow us to change depending on how did we see things uh, were going. Uh, it was something to be owned by the community. Uh, we didn't want to it to be very costly in terms of uh, effort uh, and uh, it was it needed to be accessible for for everyone so we came with uh, this idea and we put it uh, forward uh, we started uh, around a bit uh, over uh, two years um, ago we had uh, our first meeting we have been doing roughly one meeting um, uh, per month, uh, there have been uh, times that uh, we have been a bit uh, more slow, but all of that is part of the flexibility. And here on the right hand side, uh, you can see uh, the interval between uh, meetings uh, and the date of the meetings. And then you have these spikes in which we have had the uh, a longer period between meetings. Uh, they coincide with uh, holidays. Most extreme case was holidays plus conferences that uh, stopped the things for two years. Um, the financial year ends also take a lot of effort from people, so we tend to be a bit slower in that. Uh, and uh, so far, we have had uh, 16 speakers. Uh, three of them have been external from uh, other organizations, particularly from the Bureau of Meteorology in, in Australia. Uh, and we are meeting roughly minimum of 10 people 
a maximum of uh, of 30. So and it's, it's fairly well uh, taken up this um, initiative. Uh, there are some series of uh, formats that uh, we have run. As I said before, we have focused on, on flexibility, so there's no constraint in what the format can be, but uh, we have been hovering around six types. Uh, one of them is an article review, which basically is uh, someone prepares, uh, reads a paper, prepares uh, some slides uh, to incite uh, discussion. Uh, and then uh, is presented and uh, there's, uh, there's a discussion on it. Uh, we tend to provide a link to the article so people read ahead and um, get uh, the most of the, of the session. Um, I am not completely sure how much that uh, opportunity is, uh, is taking up. So another format uh, is uh, when we have an invited speaker. Uh, we tend to be a bit more formal. Just uh, is uh, is uh, when you have uh, uh, guests, uh, you try to be try, try to have the house a bit more uh, uh, tidy. Uh, and uh, so th there's uh, several ways in which we have sourced the, the speakers. Uh, sometimes we have been opportunistic and gather a visiting scientist. Uh, some others uh, from people of the uh, journal club that are not in the new organization, uh, they have offered uh, to, to lead a session and we have taken that. Uh, and there's also with um, exchange uh, 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 of, uh, of speakers with, uh, with other organizations that we have taken advantage uh, of. Uh, another format is presentation of, uh, of recent uh, work, which is basically show and tell and uh, follows with discussions and this serves uh, several uh, purposes. Uh, but uh, the main thing is if there's work uh, uh, which is not really completed, uh, you seek uh, feedback from the participants uh, and also can serve to inspire uh, other work. Is, uh, the base of the community of, uh, of practice. Uh, this has a, a slight uh, drawback, which is that when we are with uh, working with uh, uh, organizations that uh, are not uh, NIWA, um, there may be cases in which uh, the work that we are doing is with the data that doesn't belong to us. So we are working on behalf of someone uh, and that data cannot be shared um, uh, outside, so we have to be careful about that, basically. Another format is uh, a package review or a technique uh, review, uh, which uh, follows a bit more of a short tutorial style with uh, questions uh, afterward. Uh, we had uh, uh, the opportunity in, uh, in at the beginning of the year uh, we had two big conferences, uh, which was a research and the International Conference of uh, Southern Hemisphere Meteorology and Oceanography. All of them had uh, talks related with uh, data science. Uh, and uh, we say, okay, it will be good to run a session in which everybody uh, from the, that had attended these conferences just come up with a few highlights and we discuss uh, around them. Uh, unfortunately, the engagement in this activity was not particularly high, so uh, it will be good to hear your thoughts and see, because I still think it's a, it's a good thing to do, but uh, it will be nice to, to hear your thoughts on how to draw more people in this uh, kind of uh, format. Um, and the, the last uh, format is an open discussion. Um, so in, uh, the, in this case, uh, the, the best example is uh, when our uh, chief scientist um, uh, lead a session on responsibility in data science, which was uh, much more from the philosophical point of view with a short presentation and then a very, very lively discussion afterwards with a lot of strands coming out of it. So that was uh, pretty cool. Uh, and just to have, uh, for, to give you an idea of um, uh, the, the variety, um, here is uh, color coded the different formats that uh, we have uh, 
uh, use in the different um, uh, sessions that uh, that we have had in these two years. Uh, so I'm going to move now to the kind of challenges that uh, we have faced and the, which is likely that uh, they are going to be faced by other organizations. Uh, so one is the time overheads, uh, which uh, for the organizers, uh, uh, all the housekeeping things like booking the uh, meeting room, uh, list keeping, send invitations, uh, keep the records and seek, seek the look for uh, session leads. Uh, and this one is probably the one the most uh, onerous. Uh, we have tried to make it as lightweight as possible for the organizer to uh, uh, to do to do that. Uh, and then for session leads, uh, so once the a session is uh, is decided and we have a session lead, uh, the organizer just hands over uh, to the uh, to the session lead and doesn't worry about more than session apart from sending the, the reminders. Uh, and the session lead has to uh, come prepare the presentation uh, and chair the meeting and just is basically in, in their hands. Uh, moving on uh, more challenges. So engagement is, is a bit one. Um, so we have, um, we are at NIWA have many different uh, locations. Uh, we have many um, uh, disciplines and uh, how to keep all of those communities engaged and uh, working together is, uh, uh, is something that we have to look uh, after. Um, uh, and also um, for uh, gathering volunteers to lead the, the sessions, uh, people respond usually very well to a direct request. So you say, uh, can you lead a session? And uh, the answer has been usually yes. Uh, there's a bit less engagement when uh, you just put a post in and say, can anyone or does anyone to lead a question? You need to follow up uh, a few times to get uh, a response on that uh, and uh, somebody coming to say hey i can lead a question that can be a bit uh, more uh, uh, is, is more sparse uh, the next challenge is the is the continuity how to keep the group uh, going um, in our case we have uh, uh, one single person organizing so is the the bus factor is uh, is one um, uh, again, what will happen if this person is uh, run over by a bus? Uh, for me personally, it will be very bad because I am that person. Uh, but uh, I'm fairly confident that uh, with uh, the lightweight of organization uh, and with uh, having all the documentation in a place that it uh, is visible for everyone, um, we uh, the, the group will uh, will survive quite uh, quite happily. Uh, maintaining variable, uh, variety is uh, is uh, another big challenge, and uh, I have the sense that uh, at this moment we are getting very focused in uh, uh, weather and uh, and climate applications. Uh, but we have seen uh, mm, uh, more uh, uh, more general uh, sessions uh, sprouting. So. I'm confident that uh, we will keep uh, a good uh, variety. Uh, and as I have mentioned before, when we are dealing with external participants, uh, things like data ownership, uh, commercial sensitive information, etc., need to be uh, a bit uh, taken care of. So in terms of engagement, I discussed uh, this with uh, Alex Pletzer and Cams with uh, two, uh, well, we came with uh, several scenarios. The ideal scenario is that uh, you start uh, and uh, uh, people get very, very nicely um, uh, engaged and then that uh, plateaus, but uh, there's no interest uh, lost. Uh, worst case scenario, there's a lot of interest at the beginning and then it just tapers on and uh, eventually dies. Um, and um, uh, the next one, is uh, which I think is the situation that we are at the moment. 
a lot of interest at the beginning, then it tapers a bit on, but then we just go into a more or less stable uh, situation. Uh, so to conclude, uh, we have been running the Data Science Journal Club for uh, two years, roughly once a month. Uh, we have a quite varied uh, community, both in locations and in disciplines. Uh, our informal approach has seems to have worked uh, uh, pretty well, as well as the varied format. Uh, and uh, so far, uh, the level of engagement seems to have stabilized, and we won't have problems with that, so uh, fingers crossed. Uh, and uh, for discussions, I would like to put this to the audience, uh, what makes a community of practice sustainable. Uh, for me, first have to feel a need, whether it needs to measure how that it feels that need or how that, um, uh, uh, whether it is needed at all to measure that uh, is a, an open question. Definitely low organization uh, effort is is a must because it reduces, uh, unless you have a person which is dedicated to that only, uh, it uh, it will distract from other things and it will be allowed to die. Institutional support uh, is important, it's not critical, but uh, it's nice to be able to access results of the organization for like uh, email, uh, Teams platform, uh, uh, etc. Uh, and mostly uh, the buy-in from the participants, uh, how is best to to keep the uh, the particular uh, the participants engaged. Ekiana te fakatauki, poi poi a te kakano kia puawai, noreira te nakoto te nakoto te natato If you've got questions, remember to stick them into the live Q&A chat um, and we can ask them of Jorge. So there are a couple already in there. Thank you very much. Um, from Alex, we've got, um, in your opinion, Jorge, what is the best mix between informal presentations, like a show and tell kind of format uh, versus a polished presentation that might be more time consuming to prepare? Uh, well, that that depends on what the the session lead decide at that moment. If they want to invest that uh, that time, then fine. Uh, if uh, if they want to lead uh, much more as in a so one quick so one tell and then uh, discussions, then uh, absolutely fine. Is uh, uh, that is uh, the, the the beauty of uh, delegating um, is is them the one that. Uh, that decide to which level they want to, uh, and to which level they, they want to interact with uh, with the group. Hmm. Nori has got a similar question to the, the follow up one that I was going to say, which is, um, have you noticed any of the pat particular formats that are getting more engagement? Um, so usually, the the, the work, uh, the updates of work. Are the ones that gather more uh, more interest. Uh, I would say, and you can see that there's uh, more of um, uh, more, more of the sessions we are running on uh, on those. Uh, but but it's good to keep uh, some uh, some variety. And how do you decide um, what's going to be next in terms of topic? Uh, it's a first come uh, first served. Uh, so. Uh, if uh, if uh, there's uh, many people volunteering at the same time, they just uh, it's a, there's a queue, which uh, is an ideal situation. We have been several times in that, and uh, it's very good because uh, it just keeps the worries out of uh, my head for three months or so. Uh, some other times it's uh, chasing the people, and uh, there's no decision to be made. It's uh, <laughs> just um, whoever uh, uh, says yes <laughs> is the next one. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jorge. That was a really great talk. Up next, we've got our first lightning talk of the day, which is from Paula Martinez from our ARDC and also Research Software Engineer Community Manager. And she will be talking to us about Visual Research Software Interest Group. 
Hi everyone, uh, Tenoa Koto Katoa. Um, I'm Paula Martinez. I live in Australia and I come from the Jagera people where I work and live. I want to present to you a lightning talk, five minutes, to talk to you about the Visible Research Software Interest Group. This is the, the website that you can find in each of the coming slides. Uh, we are a partnership between the ARDC, the Australian BioCommons, and UNSW in Sydney. And we look forward to hearing more about who wants to be a host in New Zealand. Uh, we need um, we need to be able to see research software because without research software, we cannot make anything out of research. And the sad reality is that it is frequently unacknowledged and unpublished. So we, we think that visibility is vital to research integrity. Um, the premise to what do we mean about seeing research software is that we would like it published, to be cited and to be fair. And FAIR, as the keynote speaker Alexandra talked us about this morning, is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. The vision of the interest group is to influence change towards the visibility of research software by bringing people together. Um, we have established this uh, working group with uh, the intentions to affect change. We want to share what everyone is doing in their own domains and in their own communities to purposely affect the change of visibility of software in scholarly communications. This group seeks to engage different audiences. Uh, some of them are listed here, for example, research infrastructure managers, repository managers, research leaders, policy makers, and other advocates such as research software engineers and librarians. We want, again, to champion best practice and influence. So we want to know what are your best practices and how does your influence reach others? Uh, this group is intentionally a knowledge sharing space. And how do we do this? Uh, first, we initiated a discussion with the community in October of 2021 at eResearch Australasia. We have identified about 40 plus resources to support the community around visibility of research software. We have identified collaborators, those who self-define uh, as hosts of, of this community. And then we launched the interest group in March of this year. Anyone is welcome to join this, uh, this group. It's free of charge. We have a website. You can access the link via the bit.ly uh, or also the QR code. Uh, here we have the definition of the group, uh, contact details, some of our outputs as well. And most importantly is you can join us now by joining the conversation. We have a discussion forum on GitHub and everyone is welcome to, to see any of the conversations, add to, to those. We want to know what you're doing and we want to share with the community. That's all I have for you today. Hope to see you in the group. Thank you so much, Paula. That was really cool. If anyone's got any questions for Paula, speak them in the live chat or contact her in one of the breaks. Uh, to, uh, we're taking a bit of a, a deviation from the schedule um, and moving on to my colleagues, Richard and Lillian from ESR, who are going to talk about their shiny mobile app and working in a mobile first way. Oh, should I go first? Here are uh, everyone called Lillian Lu. Uh -huh. And uh, Kiora again. Um, it's Richard again. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll start. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we, what we wanted to do in this uh, presentation was uh, really just talk about um, kind of trying to design from the ground up um, for including mobile devices now one thing that we we do we, we've kind of done for a few years at esr is we, we we knock out websites and um data via dashboards 
But until quite recently, we've just kind of gone through basic click, 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 out, off we go, here's a dashboard, it looks great on a widescreen um, computer monitor, and just not really um, been particularly inclusive. And, and um, one thing that we had earlier in the year was an opportunity to, to kind of start something new from scratch. And um, one thing I tried to do from the very start was make it really clear that I wanted this to be public facing, and in particular, something that was um, a low barrier to get people um, to, to be able to access. Um, and, and I was just really keen to continue to push for um, uh, making sure that mobiles are kind of, I've got a, re a personal research interest in making mobiles uh, as, as usable as possible. We kind of pushing the bounds on uh, using GPUs on mobiles, but for um, the type of things we do with Shiny, uh, we're just really keen to um, push it forward. It's really weird not being in control of my own slides. So we're already on slide two. So you kind of okay. go, why is there a beehive there? Um, so so um, let's go go back to the beehive one. So okay. uh, kind of my, my really quick story on the beehive was um, kind of it, it, probably you've seen this slide before. I talked about it a couple of years ago at e research, and um, our value in, in terms of where, where I see data science. Um, in ESR is as kind of taking data, transforming it so it's kind of meaningful and we understand it, but then uh, modeling and giving people in positions of power opportunities to understand the course of their action or inaction um, by, by transforming that into knowledge and insights and actionable insights um, and then giving that to decision makers. So one thing I, I, I saw last year was an opportunity actually one, one afternoon my son's school had a half day teacher training day. Um, and for me, uh, kind of just on the outskirts of Wellington, I took him into uh, town and um, we looked down at uh, Prime Minister's Question Time at the Beehive. And one thing I observed there was that there's a room full of MPs who are decision makers in, in, in positions of power who are desperate for information and they're addicted to their phones. One thing that normal members of the public, when they go into the beehive, you get your phone taken off you. So I don't have a photo from me looking at the beehive um, from the public gallery. But one thing I was really keen to do with this development was to ensure that we make it uh, data about people's constituencies and as timely and relevant as possible, but first and foremost, to make sure it looks good both on a desktop and a tablet, but primarily to just simply break that barrier and make things available on mobile. Um, so um, I've already presented the next slide, which just kind of talked you through a bit of what we did with our early days on our Outbreak Investigator tool. I think you were, if you were here this morning, you'd have seen this one. Um, and, and then when we were given that brief of can we make a public facing one, um, we had this opportunity to build in um, from the start, making it mobile friendly. So I'll hand over to Lillian and let her kind of explain a bit more about um, what we did. Thanks, Richard, for the introduction. So um, Shiny Mobile, um, if you have built a few Shiny dashboards before, this, um, there is a good chance you have come across our libraries that are translated from JavaScript. And Shiny Mobile is just one of them. And what it translates is the Framework 7, which is a popular framework for developers to uh, build web-based applications that looks like mobile using their HTML, CSS, and JavaScript skill. And because now everything is in written uh, is written in R, it gives um, data scientists and analysts, people like me that don't have a software engineering background, a chance to build these kind of uh, applications themselves. So here is a quick example of the syntax. So before you might call dashboard page, if you use the shiny dashboard package, now you just call F7 page instead, and then you get something look like a mobile, um, layout uh, for your dashboard and the rest uh, is just whatever content that you fill in and the shiny mobile cheat sheet is very useful for me and uh, it demonstrates most of the f7 components included in the package and it also shows you how they will look on iphone compared to uh, an android phone so if you uh, just want to build a basic mobile dashboard the cheat sheet is uh, very good to follow through However, of course, if you want more than uh, what the package has to offer, you can continue to customize the functionality and layout of your mobile dashboard, again, with uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, 
Shiny Mobile is really just here to help you set up the mobile look. And we think what it can do is really analyze. Um, we have seen some great examples of what can be done if you push the limits of Shiny, something like, for example, this website is built in Shiny, which looks great. And for an outsider, you probably wouldn't have guessed it. But we haven't really seen anything that doesn't look like a mobile dashboard yet with Shiny Mobile. So if you've seen one or are building one, let us know. Um, all in all, the end product of what you build with Shiny Mobile is still web-based, and this is what we love about it. It is so easy to share, quick to update, and you don't need to install any applications on your phone, which means uh, for the development team like us, we don't need to go through the land free process with IT and then uh, get, uh, try to get a list on App Store. And I'm not sure if you agree, but I think at research organizations, cutting down any unnecessary process is very important if we want to deliver our science and insights to the community uh, in a timely manner. So this is what we have built, and we're using this to uh, engage the public with ESR's wastewater surveillance uh, program. Um, the dashboard allows individuals to track weekly updates of COVID risks in their local area, which we hope to assist with some personal decision making. Um, as you can see, it has three sessions. The first one gives a summary of what's happening in terms of COVID in wastewater at a national and a regional level. It also has some general analysis. Um, on that section. And then the second one is a, a map which allows people to look around and do some discoveries themselves. And the final session is just in, an information session in case people are curious about the methodology behind the data. And as you, we can see, it's a very simple dashboard. Um, things are mobile optimized as much as we know how, and the UI uh, and functionality is pretty much self-explained which is very important as we can't expect anyone to read a double page of instructions uh, before you use a dashboard. And here is just a quick video of through of the dashboard. Hopefully it gives you a direct sense of the mobile experience. So you can see um, it's quite clean and simple and not too many words. Uh, we really try to avoid overcrowded uh, UI. And the message is direct. If you come here first time, you will know where to go. There are, there are not really many buttons to press. Um, and the filters are applied to all graphs. So if you hit one, the other one will change. Probably need to, don't need to do it twice. And here is the map. If you allow the geolocation access and you click that, it will zoom into your local area. Somehow, I'm in Auckland, it thinks me, I'm in quite sure. <laughs> That's something to do yeah, with ESR's IP. Uh, and then again, you can uh, search an address or suburb as well. If you're going to somewhere next week, you may want to check out what's happening in that area, and it can do that too. And zooming back out, uh, if you're curious about how this virus changing over different time periods, there is a, comp a comparison filter at the bottom right. And then again, the final session is the information session, but we do have some external links that you can go to GitHub to download the data or give us feedback by viewing out a form. So that's pretty much what we built. And one thing we want to emphasize here is that mobile priori prioritize doesn't mean to sacrifice the desktop experience. So you can see here, if you, uh, your screen size become wider, the two graph become side by side rather than top and bottom, how you will see on a mobile. So with, with a few lines of CSS codes, we, we really want to make this dashboard responsive and doesn't sacrifice any, anyone's experience. Uh, also, I want to touch on what, go, uh, what Richard and Richard talked about this morning is that we use the Golem framework when building this mobile dashboard, which really helps to keep the different modules and the F7 components organized. So, uh, for example, in the stats cars module, we have the F7 car component. Then inside, we have some HTMLs to customize the tags. And similarly, in the national module, we have F7 segment, then some um, and other F7 buttons. So everything is uh, tidy up. And because it's modularized, your team members really can work on different parts of the app 
in parallel, and, and it also makes testing and debugging the app much easier than the standard shiny app uh, development approach. So that's what we have built. Now it's time to evaluate the work. First, we did receive some positive feedback on social media, keywords people mentioning uh, public access and uh, good use of uh, technology, which is uh, exactly what we like to hear. However, we also do receive a lot of feedback. Some are not very friendly, like this one, a bit overkill for the flu, whatever. But the, uh, but the point, uh, but all of the people, the people, they did wonder what is next? Why just COVID? And, and indeed, these comments help us to think about uh, future development a lot. And the point here is that um, many of these social media users, they are on mobile. And if you share the dashboard on Twitter, for example, it's much quicker for them to check it out and come back to Twitter to give you a like or some feedback if your dashboard is mobile optimized. Um, think about the mobile to mobile experience. It's really reduce some barriers to, uh, for engagement when you compare to mobile and desktop. Um, in terms of usage, we would we do have some user analytics implemented. And the light graph here tells us that during the first week of launch, we have around 15,000 users who visited our dashboard. Most of them are in New Zealand, but uh, we do get people all over the world. And this one is uh, very important for us. Uh, what it shows is that um, the non-desktop users for the dashboard are up to 48%. Uh, kind of proves that our mobile strategy is right. We are serving the need of uh, what people want. And also half of the traffic comes from news and social media sites. And when you think of how um, mobile safety these uh, platforms are, there is no way really that you can build anything without thinking about mobile experience uh, and nowadays. So, uh, uh, Cheeky promotion for tomorrow. If you want to know more about user analytics, I also have a top five minutes at 12.10. I will see you tomorrow. Now I will pass back to Richard, try to uh, control your slides and talk about uh, some lessons learned. <laughs> All right, I'll give you a, a, a next slide type thing. Um, so what, what did we learn on this one? It was a, a really great experience really to, um, to see that the team grew and, and we grew that kind of we were um, had that opportunity to step back before we dived in on this, um, that we were able to really plan um, from the start what we wanted to achieve, uh, to run through a number of mock-ups and um, using tools like Miro to, to um, rapidly create wireframes. Um, really accept that uh, the tool can only get us so far, um, that uh, this is simply where we are today, that there's lots more work coming over the horizon. And certainly for wastewater, we, we see a bright um, future in, in terms of scaling that up, some of those feedback around extra pathogens. Um, we really keen to make sure that we understand from the start that when we talk to the Ministry of Health about making this data public, um, what the key messages were, and one thing that we also kind of really pushed the bounds on here was um, pushing for more data to be released. So adding this to a GitHub repo um, and, and also publishing data at not a regional level, but something that was much smaller geographically. Um, so a kind of bit of a heads up to another talk tomorrow from one of my colleagues, Helen. Um, moving on to the next slide, one thing that's really, really been a great uh, partnership on this was working with comms teams. Um, both with ESR and also with Ministry of Health and making sure that everybody's on board. Um, they help with um, the press releases. Um, and some of the things I've, I've had in my time with ESR is actually some great media training um, and, and to make me think slightly differently about things like how we engage on social media, um, even things like how we present at uh, conferences a bit like this one. Um, Working with comms, I, I found a really great opportunity because for me as a data scientist, it, it's always led to new ideas and, and new ways of working. And this is kind of something that before I was at ESR, I remember walking into um, the, the comms team at Public Health England's headquarters. And, and that led to about a year's worth of collaborating with them on new digital apps and, and campaigns in the UK to try and get people more, um, more active. Um, in terms of the app, some next things for future development. One really big thing is um, trying to understand 
the world of um, taking this towards more of a progressive web app. So by the progressive in that, we mean something that kind of works on older browsers, but then progresses to if you've got a modern browser on a modern device and it has additional capability, like say use of the geolocation button, then um, it progresses the user experience up so it becomes more compelling and more fully featured. Um, so very keen to work, continuing to improve that, things like the splash screen, and also start to build in things like push notifications for when we publish new data, typically weekly, those, uh, those people who came previously get a notification saying, hey, there's new data for your local area, so please come back and have another look at it today. Um, that's not the end for wastewater. There's lots more to come. Um, it's great to start to see that the field of wastewater epidemiology has really received a rocket booster during COVID. Um, but we start to see overseas the um, new use is in things like looking for polio. And currently um, in the UK and in New York, polio has been detected in wastewater um, and therefore has driven a, a fresh vaccination campaign. Uh, similar in, in New Zealand, we're standing up an assay for polio or monkeypox and for other um, disease, um, which may include um, well, infectious disease, the, the example there, we, we also have added in some stuff around uh, the, the work we do around uh, drugs in wastewater and so on. So um, lots of cool examples. I'm really keen to see that we continue to push for making sure that our data sets are as open as possible and available on as broad a range of devices, whether that's um, tablet, mobile, or kind of traditional desktop. And um, thanks for our listening this afternoon and I would love to to keep that conversation going and keep that engagement going. So I don't know if we've got time, but maybe quick questions. You could share the, the link to the app uh, for people to have a bit of a play with it themselves uh, since it's publicly available. Remember everybody, um, add your questions to the live Q&A. Um, I'll have one while we're waiting to see if any others come along. Um, perhaps you could put it into the discussion forum, Richard. Um, my question is, uh, Richard, you talked about that it it only goes so far. Um, is there any key areas, and this is to both of you, um, where you feel that it's still got a little bit of development needed to be up to good standard? Um, in terms of... Um, seven uh, framework seven rather than your app i think we did uh, encounter quite a few issues when we're trying to again shiny mobile is just um like a skeleton whatever you put in there is another thing right because fra framework seven is kind of javascript related and we use quite a lot of javascript libraries like the chart is apex charter and I'm sure Richard can tell you all the <laughs> tricks he encountered while, while trying to make Apex Charter work in our language. Yeah. I think one thing where I, I kind of see maybe the limits of Shiny or the limits of R being single threaded, um, kind of, I think this has been a great project because as we've continued to develop our capability, we've, we've kind of maybe nudged against a few of those. And at this point, Shiny, um, Shiny Mobile, F7, etc., has just made our life easier and taken away a number of the the steps we may yet proceed along at some point down the line. Um, it, because that, that kind of separation of the back end from the front end, the, the kind of potential to develop more of an API, to develop the CSS and the JavaScript side, um, means that we don't necessarily always need to be tied to R and to Shiny Mobile. But in this instance, at this point in ESR's journey, um, it's just been incredibly helpful, yet it doesn't kind of stop us from somewhere down the line switching that back end into something else. But for a, I think for a, a relatively small development team of people who are kind of data scientists and and, and statisticians and not necessarily from um, just a software engineering background or a web development background, it's been incredibly powerful um, and a really good opportunity for us to um, really start to push for that engagement with the public. The other thing is I've kind of always found that actually in terms of social media engagement, then actually the, the general public really love to talk about poops. 
um, which has led to some fabulous kind of, we, we see when we look at the analytics, that's actually the, the more often you thank everyone for their contribution this week, the more you get retweets and that's hilarious. Roland's kind of reiterated and maybe you'd like to expand on uh, what the limitations of Shiny that you've come across might be. Any other ones? Um, well, I, I think personally, probably the, the only bit where I kind of felt a bit stressful was um, slightly worried about day one launch and whether things would break. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we used shinyapps.io and proud to say it performed perfectly. Um, and, and I think a decent amount of that was the way that we structured the app in the background. So it's not heavy on database queries and the data's pre-processed. Um, but we were, I think we were really happy with how it worked. And I think maybe um, as the tool develops and becomes more professional, more understanding of how um, an app could scale. So if we saw 10 times or 100 times that, um, that uh, sudden burst, um, but we felt that actually the, the burst mode within shinyapps.io certainly um, made us aware of what was happening, um, made us aware of how many users were currently active on the website and whether that was starting to hit a memory limit. And um, I think day one, at one point, we um, upped the memory just to, to make it a more comfortable experience for us. And after that point, we've not really had to do much more tweaking. Um, but that kind of that single threaded nature um, means that you kind of every so often it spills up a new server automatically, but um, for, for us on this app, it's, it's just work. Awesome. Well, thank you again for that really useful talk. Um, and thank you again to all of our presenters for this session. Uh, we are leaving the session slightly early. Uh, we had some technical difficulties with one of our speakers. So you guys all get an extra long break before the birds of the fifth this session that starts at 4.20. So thank you all for attending and uh, see you next time.